Um, I'd like to introduce um, Steve Mahari. Steve uh, is an independent director, commentator and consultant and uh, talking to him before I came up here. Steve spent most of his life talking and I'm sure he'll, he'll tell you about that. Interesting, interesting career of sharing wisdom. He was previously the Vice Chancellor of Massey University uh, in 08 to 2016 and he was a member of Parl Parliament, as you'll all know, uh, for PAMI from 90 to 2008. He was a senior cabinet minister between 1990 and 2008, holding a variety of portfolios, including the Minister for Education. He is a senior lecturer in sociology prior to entering parliament. Super great platform to go in on. And earlier in his career, he was a junior lecturer in business studies. He was a Palmerston North City Councillor between 1986 and 89, and was awarded Companion of New Zeal the Companion of New Zealand Medal in 2008. Gee, you've been busy. Wow, unbelievable. His keynote topic today is connecting with the future. More than anything else, it is education that prepares us for the future. But at a time of unprecedented change that is happening at an ever accelerating pace, what does the future look like? And what kind of education do young people need to ensure they can thrive? And this was a conversation we were having last night um, at the, the Black Heart. So uh, yeah, without further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome um, Steve up onto the stage. Cheers. Thank you for inviting me to be part of your conference. Do you feel okay? You look good. That was a very tired response though, wasn't it? I mean, we go to a conference in Mount Cook a little while ago. Anybody was there, by the way? And the first thing they said to me is, we're exhausted. We're having a really good time here. We'll try to stay awake while, you're, while we're up here. I'll try to keep you awake today, but I know, as, as has already been said, that uh, the challenge for you, in many cases, is, is dealing with an incredibly difficult job with a lot of people putting pressure on you. This is a chance to sit back, reflect, think about things and hopefully go back a bit refreshed. Now, I know you're a caring group of people. Would you say a caring group of people? So only the people on this side are allowed to take pictures of me <laughs> because on this side you'll be saying, what the hell's going on with these people? You know, they've roughed them up. Well, I, I should tell you very quickly so you do relax. I went out for a a jog I used to run, but I'm too old now, so I jog with my dog. And my dog tripped me up on the, um, on the gravel path coming down a hill. She thought it was great. She wondered what I was doing. New part of a game. <laughs> but this is just the tip of it. There's more of it that goes, goes down <laughs> through here. But it is healing. So just, just on this side, if you wouldn't mind, on this side, no cameras <laughs> for, the, for the whole time. Now, I'm going to talk about connecting uh, with the, the future. And the song you heard, some of the more what we, of a certain age in the room <laughs> will know. No, you laughed. What was the song? Who was it by? You get a, you get a Moro bar. No, you don't. I didn't have any. But <laughs> Anybody guess who the song was by? Who's old enough to know this? Thunderclap Newman. During a, a period of time when those of us a little bit older would remember revolutionary time, all sorts of change was in the air. So the theme of the song is something in the air. And you should call out people who are going to do something about it in the song they call them instigators. I want you, you can do what you like really because I'm only here for a little while, but I'd like to think <laughs> you might go back to your school if you're not already doing this, saying to yourself there is a major change in education going on and I am going to lead it because I'm in the education sector and I'm sick and tired of people who are not in the education sector telling us how to do this. The education sector should lead these changes. It should cooperate and work with other people, but you're in it. You are the leaders, and that's what I hope you'll do. Now, how do you do that? Well, I think the key to being able to lead is, first of all, to understand what's going on. If you don't understand what's going on, it's very difficult to say what you'll do as a leader. Once you've understood what's going on, you can start to say, 
Well, what kind of education fits that, that kind of future? Now, little, little caveat here, if we knew what the future was, it wouldn't be the future, because the future is unknown. But what we can do is we can look at things that are, are trends with momentum that are going to be very hard to see not going on. So we can't speculate and guess and say this is what will happen in five or ten years' time. Who knows what's going to happen in ten years' time. Mr Trump could still be president. It would be horrible. You know, it could be an awful world. But we can say there is a trend. It's got a lot of momentum behind it. It's going to go somewhere. And if I understand that, I can start to think about what I might do in response to it. So those are the two things I want to send you away with today, just the, the ability to understand what's going on and then to think a few thoughts about, well, how do I respond to that as a person in the education sector? So, we all went to school. I went to school. I didn't like school. I left early, left when I was 15 because I couldn't wait to get out. Went to work for the state insurance company for about a week, valuation department for two and then went off to do other sorts of things, because in those days, you remember, it was so easy to get a job. As long as you had a beating heart and could breathe, someone would employ you. And that's what often happened to people like me. Who often, it's all I was doing, actually, at work, is having a beating heart and breathing. I went to school, though, of this kind. And I'm not saying it was bad education, by the way. Lots of people thrived on this education. They thought it was excellent. Enter the classroom, sit at a desk, listen to the teacher, read from the blackboard. Remember blackboards? write an exercise book, hand in the work, run around the playground, go back to the classroom and do it all again. That was the script, as ethno-methodologists call it. That was the script. That's the way you did education. There was a curriculum that people taught to. They did it in regular forms, in periods, went through all this, and you would say to yourself, what is the value of that kind of education. I'm going to ask you lots of questions, rhetorical, because I won't force you to answer me. But think in your, in your mind here, what's the value of that sort of education? Well, some people would say none. I don't think so. I think there's lots of things that you could draw out of this sort of education that will help you with discipline. It'll help you with memory. It'll help you with conforming. It'll do all the things the education system was about in the last century and for many people still is, because you can still go to schools that teach a version of this kind of, of script every day in their, their classroom. It's an authority model. It says the teacher is an authority. The children are people who are there as children. They will be people who will be instructed in what they should do. And by the way, I spent a good deal of my life in that model. Universities still largely teach this kind of model. They insist on the authority figure at the front. The students do the business of taking down their, their information. Most university people are not trained in teaching it at all, so they have no idea to do anything other than instruct people. So it's a model that's still viable, and it has some value. It has some value. So keep that in, in mind. But if you say to yourself then, but does that model fit the world we're going to live in and living in, let me just work you through a few examples of why perhaps not. First of all, have a look at diversity. This is the second most diverse country in the world now. Second most diverse country in the world. Go to Vancouver, you get just slightly more diversity than here. But about 164 different cultures now live in this wonderful country of ours. We are therefore in the situation of looking at classrooms full of people who are different. What do you do in a situation like that as a teacher? Do you say, my role in this room is to say, how do I make them all the same? How do I integrate them? So they might come from India or Somalia or they may be Maori or they may be Pacific Island or what if there are lots of Pacific Island nations, by the way, we kind of lump all these people together, or Asians, which is amazing. We refer to Asians when they run all the way from India to China to whatever, lump all these people together and start to say, well, is that the way forward? That we just say the diversity in the classroom is going to be melded together in one particular way, as you would if you were using that old model. You would simply say, there's a curriculum, you've got to know it, doesn't matter where you came from, you're going to do this. This is the way we will work. Globalisation, integration of markets across the world, which of course is being contested now. People talk about deglobalisation these days, that's really difficult to see happening. As, as a trend, 
there's so much integration now that the idea that we're going to move away from that in any serious way is hard to speculate on, possible, but not really. And of course the rise of Asia, particularly of China. So when we talk about that, are we producing entrepreneurial global citizens who have the capacity to understand other cultures and speak other languages? How many people in the room, just as a little test, talk anything other than English or Māori? How many people now, how much talking now, I should say, is this, this, this is beyond <laughs> ni hao, right? <laughs> okay, so you could hold a conversation and ask where the beer comes from and all that sort of stuff. That's quite good. But if you have a look at our schools at the moment, the number of kids who are in classes learning Asian languages of any kind is going down, not up. Down, not up. And yet, we are a little wee nation in a globalising world that can only survive by connecting with people all over the world. Make no, no trade if we don't get out there and do things, and yet we're sending most of our kids out without the capacity to fluently speak a language like Bahasa or go to any country and really sit down with people and converse in their own language. Are we really preparing people for the future? Might be a question. Well, we wouldn't be if we were using the old model. Have a think about computers. We used to think that Moore's Law might run out. Now we know Moore's Law's not running out, that with the capacity of computers is carrying on growing. So what we're now faced with is a world where people have access to this all the time, they've got databases all the time, We've got these sorts of numbers of people who are on the net and are making use of things and that's going up all the time and they're getting more and more information. How do you teach people in a classroom if they can know what you're telling them before you tell them? Because they can pick up in their hand the most powerful computer around, namely their smartphone, if you allow them in school and don't switch off the Wi-Fi. They've got there the ability to say, you, you won't say, well, who were the blah, blah, in whatever country, and they can say, well, give me two seconds and I'll just repeat that information back to you. If the old curriculum relied upon transfer of information, most students can get that now anyway. It's one of the most frightening things for university lecturers who sometimes ban computers from their classroom because the kids are sitting there in the classroom typing what they are talking about and before they can ask them a question, have already got the answer, and then they can converse. The teaching model has to change. How do you teach people who already have this information and why would you bother? Computers to AI is computers to artificial intelligence and once you've got artificial intelligence you can move towards IA. That is an independent application. That is that you in the future will simply have all of this as a person at your fingertips tailored to you thinking about what you want, sensitive to where you are. For example, sitting here in the room with your assistant next to you, your individual assistant sitting next to you, and you're saying, well, I actually should be at school now, and they're doing it all for you. They're all doing all the paperwork for you. They're, they're assisting you all the time. Now, how do you teach people in a situation where the curriculum now, if it's content only, they've already got it? and they've probably got it in a better form than you can give it to them. How do you teach that? In the old model? Sort of difficult if you were using that. End of jobs. One in three jobs, we are now told, in the US, will be replaced by technology in 20 years' time. This is a scary thing that everyone talks about these days, that these kids are going to grow up and go into a world where it's going to be difficult to get the kinds of jobs we've had to now. I'm not a person, actually, by the way, who believes that there will be no jobs. I think there will be jobs. I think that, that we've seen through history the ability for people to change into new areas of high-touch jobs, for example, in the future, which a lot of, means a lot of communication with people, a lot of ability to relate to people. Those, those will not be done by machines because people will still want to relate to people. So you are probably safe on the whole as teachers. You're probably not going to replace. But part of what you're doing can be replaced, namely all information that you send to other people. That can be replaced. So are we, pro we producing people who can invent their own job will become the question. So when you're talking to your own kids, remember, you often say to them, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you annoy them, really, 
right from very young. As Sir Ken Robinson says, we've got to the point now where kindergarten children are brought into the room and the teacher says, well, you've been here six months, what do you want to do with your life? <laughs> you know, sort of into that. And that's probably partly reflecting the fact that people are very anxious about the fact that it's a very changing world. So if we don't start thinking about this, are we preparing people? But if we're preparing people with the idea that there'll be a job to go to, as in my day, leaving school early, hundreds of jobs to pick from, always able to get a job, then we're letting them down. Because they have to invent their own job, as Thomas Friedman would say. This is a world where you have to, the question really is, what job do you think you could invent for yourself, is the question. Are we inventing kids like that? Are we equipping them so that they can deal with that kind of world? Men and women, I think this is one of the biggest issues, particularly for young men, as we know, who are struggling in the school system. I see the Dominion newspaper today, a school talking about the fact that seven out of ten of the top scholarships went to women in the school, <coughs> and that's worrying them because there's a trend now for boys underperforming in schools in a way which they've got to figure out how to try and change. And we know that one of the issues we've got now is that more and more women are coming to the workforce, that's changing the dynamic of the workforce, that's really good, but are we changing the way men look at themselves and the way women look at themselves? One of the things about diversity, for example, that amuses me a great deal is people go on and on about having to get people from ethnic backgrounds or gender backgrounds <laughs> into places like boards, and then they celebrate that they've got someone who is different gender or come from a different ethnicity by saying, and they're just like us. I didn't know that. They might look different, but I've managed to make them behave just like us. Is this the future we can talk about in a country where we're diversifying? Not really. We have to start thinking about how to reshape traditional roles. Are we doing that in the classroom? And could you do it with the old style of, of education? The rise of the individual, the selfie generation, the notion that we are living with people now who simply want it their way. Now, there are negatives to that, obviously. Trying to live in a society where everybody wants everything exactly the way that they want it can turn into the kind of selfishness that we see around the world today, which is pretty negative. But on the other side of this, it is simply a trend that says, I would like things that relate to me. I don't want to have to spend my time trying to look at things in a way which I have no interest in, no relevance to my life. I would like to have things done in a way which let me learn properly, but in ways, in ways that are relevant to me. How do you do that in a school, particularly if you use old methods? How do you do it at all? New manufacturing. This is additive manufacturing, which is one of the revolutions in the world at the present time, which is clearly not going to go away. What's this going to do for, for a country like New Zealand, by the way, that's lost almost all of its manufacturing, is it may bring it back again. This is one place there may be jobs for people who are going to be doing things in the future because they'll be able to make all sorts of things, including these golf balls, right here. Won't have to do it elsewhere because 3D printing will do that for us. How tech savvy are our kids? In, in most schools now, as I just talked about before, this whole idea is just taken for granted. But how tech savvy are our kids? If we would go to some of the schools that you know about in the US, for example, at the cutting edge of this, in California, we know not well. We're not investing enough as a country in making sure kids have access to the kinds of things they need to do if they are going to be that sophisticated. And this is a country that has to be sophisticated because we live at the bottom of the world a long way from everybody else. We could easily be forgotten. There are only 5 million, maybe 5.5 of us soon, I'm told, with this increase in migration. It's a tiny nation. If we aren't the best at what we do, this makes life really hard. So, are we breeding tech-savvy kids? And the sharing economy. A lot of these kids are going to go into an economy based on things like Amazon, Airbnb, Uber, something I learned yesterday called Eat Well, which is a new thing. You could try this as a business if you're sick of teaching. It doesn't exist in New Zealand, so you can start it now. This is a sharing economy idea. You can pay me for it afterwards. Eat Well is a website that says, today you're cooking. I don't know, what do you cook tonight? We won't cook anything, you'll be here. <laughs> what would you normally cook? Lasagna, will Jules say. That goes on the web. You're saying, oh, sick of cooking tonight. 
I'll take the family to get some lasagna. And the website allows you to do that. And you just turn up with your two kids who are rambunctious and awful and will destroy the house <laughs> and your husband and you have your lasagna and you make a few bob because you put on there lasagna tonight it will cost you $50 a head, 20 for kids, and you make some money and this is sweeping countries around the world. Eat well. New idea. I can tell there's a lot of people here saying, I hope you finish this soon. I'm going to start that before anybody <laughs> else, before else does. But what this does, of course, is it creates a precariat, a group of people who are like the people who work for Uber, who are in absolutely insecure. They just have their own car. They're within the sharing economy, but they could be gone tomorrow. Very difficult. Got no insurance, no backup. The company doesn't support them. They just work on their own. Are we producing young people that have got that kind of ability to be resilient and establish themselves in this kind of world? Because as much as there are many faults with this, it's not going to go away. This is clearly a trend that is going to get bigger and bigger, and many more people are going to work in precarious kinds of situations, and they'll need to think through how they do that. Climate change, end of fossil fuels. Are we producing innovators? This, this issue, by the way, of, inno of, of the environment, climate change and so on, isn't going to be solved by saying don't do things because people will do things as long as there's no alternative to doing what they do. So if they're going to drive around a fossil fuel car, they're going to do it, regardless of what we tell them, if they still have to get the kids to school and go on holiday and go to work, they're going to drive the car with the oil in the car. People are going to still turn on lights, they're still going to throw out rubbish. Not about you, but my wife is obsessed with plastic, and she's been on a personal kind of vendetta against plastic at shops for the last six months, and she cannot get away from plastic, no matter what she tries. She goes to the shop and they insist on wrapping things in plastic, you know, like a piece of corn, and you take it to the, the thing and they say, would you like that in a plastic bag? And she says, no, no, I don't even want it in the plastic in the first place, but why would you put it in another plastic bag when it's already in one? The whole world is awash with this stuff. It's not going to go away unless we think of a different way of doing things. Are we producing kids that can do that? That right from the beginning are innovative about the way we live and can come up with different kinds of solutions. Do we, how are they going to live in this kind of connected culture? This guy has 100 million followers plus, you may be one of them, 100 million followers plus on the social platforms that he is on. This is amazing. Nobody in political history has ever had that reach. So this man, whatever you think of him, understands this is where the action is. And want to go to the Dominion newspaper, who cares, no one reads it anyway, is what he's thinking. He's saying, I can get to you directly, unfiltered, off all these social platforms. He's the first person to do it. Obama did a lot of this, by the way, as his predecessor, but he had 40 million followers. This guy's over 100 million. He's figured out this is, this is the way to do it. Now, this is a changed world, this connectivity. Nobody had Facebook in 2004. It's developing enormously quickly. So are we equipping young people to work in this kind of world, in this very connected kind of thing where they're never off, where they're always on show, where they're working in a different way, and it's no point, I don't think, in us saying they shouldn't, because this is just going to get better and easier to do, and it will be the way that they will live their lives. So we can teach them about the way to use it, but we can't teach them not to use it, because why would you bother? Remember in the old days when you first got your phone, you thought you would just use it like a landline? You know, you think, oh, a telephone is where you go to something stuck in the wall and pick it up and ring. And so you got your mobile phone finally. You probably might have had one of those big brick things that you held first of all. But eventually you got a highly mobile phone and you were still tempted to kind of not use it all the time. How stupid is that? The whole point was that you could use it all the time and that's what kids do. And we have to figure out how to live in that kind of world. So what's going on? How do you reduce all of this massive change to something that you can understand as a way that the world is moving. Well, I think it's simply this. It is massive, it is rapid, it's going to get more massive, and it's going to get more rapid. So it's not going to be any different to, to that. That's a trend that cannot stop now, simply because there's so much change going on, it's going to get more, and the speed will get faster and faster because technology 
as an enabler of this change is going to get faster and faster. So we can assume that. We also need to understand that we are moving from a world that was homogeneous, that was standardised and had scale. And if you drive around New Zealand and look at any school that was built in the middle of the last century, they look like factories, don't they? They look exactly like scale businesses. So what we've got in, in systems all over, not just education, but all over the world, are ways of doing things that are about sameness, about standardising what they're doing, and about trying to get as much scale out of it so that it's cheaper to do. That was the whole idea of scale. But because of all of these changes, we're now moving to a world which is about diversity, about difference, and about fragmentation. Now think about the challenges for us in education. Think about a university that you've all been to that was absolutely homogeneous, standardised and scaled. That's what they all were. Now if you take something very simple like the curriculum in a university, one of the things you're now seeing is the digitisation of curriculum so that it can be then chopped up in different kinds of ways to meet the needs of different audiences. This is not how university lecturers have worked historically. What they did was write the material themselves, they'd often write it out in personal notes, and go and deliver it. Now they're being asked to say, but why do we do that? Students can get that anyway, you can give it to them on the web if you want to. All of that content is just able to be dispersed whenever you want to. What we want now is all of that information so that we can chop it, change it. We want to teach a professional course, that's good. An undergraduate course, that's great. We want to do all sorts of things with this information that we might be able to sell to people. We must put it into a position now that is utterly different to the homogeneous, standardised world. It's got to be able to be diversified, differentiated, fragmented. And big scale things are going to start breaking up as they are. You see all around the world now, if they're big companies, they're fragmenting internally. If they're smaller companies, they're staying smaller companies and clustering. Now think about that model for your school and you're starting to think about how you need to change in response to these trends if you agree with me they're not going to stop. You're starting to think about how to do this. So how's education doing in all of this? Well, I've said not so good up there, but let me be very clear with you. I've visited probably more schools <laughs> than I want to over my life. And I think we have a pretty good system here in New Zealand. I think the universities probably as a system are in the top 10 in the world. We have a schooling system that any of us can go around the world and proudly talk about early childhood, the great things at primary, the great things at secondary level. We've got a hell of a lot to be proud of in our schools. But you're kind of a, a political football, <coughs> and you have been since the Royal Commission in the 1980s. If you remember the Royal Commission, it was a very large thing that David Long referred to as a doorstop because no one read it. I did, actually, because most of it was good sociology, so I read a lot of it. But you've just been a political football since then because no one can make up their mind what they feel is wrong with what's going on in schools and what they would like to do about it. So his ongoing argument about why don't boys perform, why don't girls perform, why don't lower socioeconomic kids perform, what's wrong with the system for Māori, why are Pacific Island kids not doing so well, why do gifted kids have to go to special classes because they can't get it in the class they're in, and on and on and on we go with this kind of argument. This is, this is I want to come back to that point I made earlier, absolute the need for leadership absolutely the need for leadership, because a system that carries on being as unsupportive of what needs to happen is not doing you any good, not doing our students any good, not doing the country any good. You cannot go on forever with this level of debate about what's the kind of thing we should be doing. There should be some confidence about something as crucial as the education system. So education has a lot to be proud of but it operates in this environment of constant back and forwards arguments about how we should handle things. And the reason for that is the change we've just talked about. All that change is pushing on people and they're saying, well, what do I do about my kids? And employers are saying, I can never get anybody prepared for my business. And kids are saying, I don't really like the school anymore. And teachers are saying, well, what's the best way to respond to these kinds of things? That's the problem. 
understanding that that change is there and what does the change mean for me as a person working in the education sector. Well, for some people, all they do is double down on the way we used to do things. And this is employers, this is parents, this is some of our leading schools around the, the country who set this example, as Ken Robinson once again would say, of saying the way to solve this is to do more better of what we did before. More better of what we did before. So more standardisation, more targets set. I went to a, I have to say, any ministry people here, because I love the ministry, you did me proud, thank you very much if you're here. But I went to a, a session and I was supposed to go to five of them, I could only stomach one, it was just unbelievably awful. Went to the session where a lady had been brought out from the, from the UK, where they are obsessed with targets. And so we spent four hours talking about where the education system should go in the central North Island. At the end, she stood up and introduced herself and talked about what she was doing and said, I have calculated 56 more people through NCEA Level 2 and the problem solved. Will you commit to giving 56 more people the chance to get through NCEA Level 2? And, and the principals sat there in kind of stunned amazement and said, well, pff, you know, we want them to get through, so all right. This is not the solution. The notion that we would just simply say our education system is about a target, anybody can hit a target. All you have to do is change the way you get there, and you can get there quite quickly. It's a bad way to run a system. Accountability goes up on you, and universities have accountability through the roof now, more testing and exams. We, as you know, are now the most examined population of school students to be found in the world. NCA was not supposed to be about that, but it's become about this constant kind of testing of young people all the time. Now, that, you have to say to yourself, sounds a little like the old system, doesn't it? And if we're doing all this response to change, are we doing our kids proud by examining them and testing all the time? And I noticed on the news today that there are people saying we should just stop this, you know, this is something we shouldn't be doing, national standards, we should be thinking about a different way. But I would urge you, there is no way forward in a political debate unless you offer an alternative. You can't say, I'm not doing that, because you will do it, because unless there's an alternative, you've got to do something. So you'll go to school and carry on doing the same things. And that's what's happening at the moment. This debate is not offering enough of an alternative. A lot of competition, a lot of ranking. I got this the other day, which no doubt you had a look at to see where your school is if you're in Auckland. Metro, they put out every year, and the pride of joy goes to these pages where they rank the local schools so that parents and employers can say, oh, that's the, that's the best one. Why is it best? Once again, exams tell you which is the best school here in Auckland. Now, at one level, as I said before, there's nothing wrong with that. Discipline, memory, all sorts of things are, are valued there. But if that's the only thing we're judging on, we've got a problem in homework. People get home, sent home, do lots of homework, and, and yet, as research tends to show, this constant focus on homework rather than a diversified range of activities a young person might be involved in may not be the best thing for them. But it sounds good, doesn't it? Parents do this all the time. They say, I experienced this, I suffered, I had to go and be bored sick all the way through my school and I had to do homework and compete and sit exams and all of that kind of stuff. Why shouldn't you? And the, this is not a, a, you know, a, a comment of a negative kind on parents because parents are worried about their kids. And so they say, what do I know? I know the schooling system I went to and I want to hear about it. I went to a school the other day just to, I go drop into schools now and again and just to say, am I still talking things that are relevant? So I went to a, a school the other day, I think a very good school, and the principal was saying to me that one of the problems they've got is they've moved away from this to something I'm going to talk about in a moment and had four students almost immediately removed from the school and sent to a much more traditional school because the parents came along and said it's just not the kind of education that we recognise and we're not going to take the risk. So we're going to put them into a school where they do all of these kinds of things, wear a uniform, that's very conformity, 
and we understand that and we think you know this is the way things should be so the kids are out of there and he said and I think we'll lose a few more as well because we want to move down this direction therefore it's going to be a challenge to the the parental this is a primary school the parent group so this is safe haven and this I, I really like our previous minister of education as a person but had some real difficulty with the fact that despite all the rhetoric about change we were actually doing this we're still allowing ourselves to go down this track of, of a standardised, conformity, homogeneous scale form of education. Now the point is, no one else is doing this. Education is one of the most conservative areas of any society because education is just built for inertia. It's huge, it involves everybody, it's really important to everybody. You've got parents thinking, because I went to school, I'm an expert. You've got people who are employers saying, I want a certain type of person, why don't you give me exactly what I want? It's, it's a big, inert area in our society. But meanwhile, everyone else is changing. And the words that really explain this are flexible specialisation. If you look at almost any other sector of society, including the big clumsy state organisations, they're trying to become increasingly flexible. There's, they're constructing themselves in a way which allows them to move to what they want to do next. And they are specialised. They get very good at what they should do, knowing that they will have to move to something else and specialise again. Get very good at what they're doing. That means that lying behind this are extremely skilled people, a lot of technology, all of the things that go with any modern industry. And you have to think, really, when you consider your own area of work, how do I make it so I can be flexible and shift all the time? And how can I make sure that what we're doing is absolutely tailored to the needs of the people who are being involved with my service? That's what all other areas of activity are trying to do. And I think you're seeing it in education as well, but mainly it's happening by people who are outside education. So where are the big disruptors, as they like to call it, say, in the education sector? It's the Khan Academy, it's Corsair, who are not in education at all. They're outside it, but they're coming into the education space and saying, I can offer you something utterly different as an experience because it's flexible and I can tailor it to you and I can give you exactly what's needed to give you a great education. They're going to do some real damage to universities, by the way, because universities are perhaps the mo most difficult to change. Steeped in tradition and ways of doing things with staff who are not trained in teaching and so on, very difficult to shift. So universities, particularly the middle-ranked ones, not Harvard, not although Harvard is one of the ones that's changing, not those kinds of universities, but the many middle-ranked ones, and that's all New Zealand universities. All of them are in deep trouble in the next 20 years unless they find some way of beginning to move towards this kind of, of model because otherwise it's, people are going to go around them. So you'll be saying to yourself, where shall I go to university now? Oh, Actually, I could go to university at Northwestern in Chicago, one of the great universities which is currently say, setting itself a goal of being one of the big global higher education businesses online in the world. That's their game plan. That's what they want to do. And it's a, it's a better ranked school than anything in Australasia. So why would you say to yourself, as somebody who's wanting to upgrade your qualifications, I, I would go somewhere else? So we've got a, an issue if we don't begin to change, certainly in our universities. Now, what would that look like? Well, the phrase I like to use is personalising learning. Personalising, the personalisation of learning. Not individualising learning. Because as we all know, learning is a social process. It's not an individual process. You need that interaction with people if you're going to learn properly. So personalising does not mean individualising, as many people translate the modern change to be. It still has to have that component of social. And I'm, I'm going to go through this reasonably quickly because you'll, you'll be familiar with some of this. But what it means is that you're going to transform. You're not going to say, I'm just going to change a little bit. I'm going to transform education because we're now living in this knowledge-based society that allows us to make sense of all of these changes. I'm going to differentiate provision that meets differentiated needs. So I'm confronted with a class of high diverse students on ability, on ethnicity, on all sorts of things. 
they've got different needs. So I have to differentiate what I'm doing so each of them gets what they want and all the resources that are available for learning need to be applied to flexibility. How do we do that? How do we make sure that we are able to be flexible? So that's, that's broadly what a system like this would try to do. That means for students some pretty radical changes, not in all schools, as I said before, there are many leaning towards this, school activities centred on their individual needs, interested in aptitudes, which kind of means that if you want them to read Shakespeare, but perhaps it's better that they read Ihimara, they read Ihimara, because they're still reading, they're still getting better at it, but it's more relevant, and once they do that, they can come back to Shakespeare sometime, which I certainly think they ought to, if they want to understand the sort of background of their world they live in, going back to these people is great, but why, why do they have to read it in the first place? What's, what's that about? So their interests, their aptitudes, the system is reshaped and customised and they're engaged about their own learning. I've talked to parents when I say to them that the kids should be able to self-assess. They should know why they got that, that grade. I mean my, my oldest, for example, when he went to university, came home one day and said he didn't understand why he got a C because he rated himself and hadn't got used to having anything much lower than a B plus. And I said, well, the first thing you do is go back and ask it to be explained. He went back and the lecturer, lecturer said to him, these are the words he quoted back to me, he said, I do not know, Dylan. Marking to me is like a gestalt. It just comes together and it's what I feel. So I don't know. Unbelievable, eh? Unbelievable that someone would say, I can't tell you how to improve your performance because I just feel it. It's a kind of, you know, thing. This is ridiculous. There needs to be an ability not only for us to explain to kids, but kids should be able to self-assess. Otherwise, how do they, in this system, approve? If all you're doing is ranking children, you don't want them to know what happened. In fact, it used to be the case in universities that the last thing you were allowed to do was to give kids feedback on their exams. And it got to the point where the OIA meant that kids would OIA their exams, and so the instruction came round the universities which said, do not write on an exam script, use post-its, because then you can take them off. And the kids will never know why they got that grade, and that's what we want. This is not the way we should do education unless you're ranking, because then all you, all you care about is you're better than you. And that's, that's good, then you know that, but you don't need to know anything else because all it is about is who's better than who. If you're about learning, kids should be able to assess themselves. What does it mean for parents and families? It means they become engaged. It means they're a learning community. It means they get into that kind of to and fro of discussion. It means they get regular access to information about the child all the time. And it means that they help plan. And this is something I've do to encourage you is that a lot of kids are brought to school and they're expecting you to sort them out. When you use this model, one of the things you need to say to parents is, I know you brought your child to school, but the child wasn't good enough. Bring me a better one. <laughs> you have a responsibility to work with us on this stuff and not expect that you can bring them to school and we'll get them in shape and discipline them and educate them and we only have them for six hours, you have them for their life. Bring us a better child because you are involved in a community of learning. It's not separate from you. So you have a role to play as well. The schools themselves, they will have to change. Customising programmes, community networks, learning communities, seeing themselves as knowledge producing, even very young kids. One of the most exciting things I ever do as Minister of Education is the early childhood sector, which was really bolting along at that particular time. I remember going to an early childhood centre and the kids greeted me, these are early childhood students, greeted me with a camera. They were making a film of my, my uh, arrival. I said to the teachers, this can't be happening. You, you've got them wandering around with the camera and then you'll do all the work. They said, no, they'll edit it. And they did, and they sent it to me. These are kids who are under five, who were doing this kind of, of work, knowledge producing, professional ethos that accepts and assumes every child has a different knowledge base, a different school s skill set, aptitudes and aspirations, and students' needs are assessed and their talents developed through diverse teaching strategies. This is one of the most difficult things, isn't it? Because a kit bag of, of skills that has to get wider and wider is a big challenge for, for anybody, particularly people who feel what they're doing 
it's pretty good. I've done this for 40 years. What am I want to change for? It's going to be hard for people to do it, but changing. Oh, by the way, one of the little exercises you might like to do, I read, um, I used to use a little article from a newspaper, School Can Remain Nameless. They were given a lot of money <coughs> to do things in their school, and they made a conscious decision, had a chance to rebuild rooms. Do this for yourself in your own head once again. Got lots of money, rebuild part of the What do they decide to do? They said, we want to reinforce our model of education, which is teacher at the front, students in desks, fixed desks there, and they get instructed. It's a very good school, by the way. They get good results and so on. Very, very much the authority relationship that's traditional. The one concession they made was that the room was rounded, so the desk went round like that. Now, if you, if you were given a million dollars, what would you do to design your school? Is an interesting thing, isn't it? Would you say, it's going to be a room like that, teacher at the front, authority relationships reinforced, all of those kinds of things will go on in, in our school, or would you do something different? Because there's been that discussion, hasn't there, that this kind of change, these open plan things like the beanbag culture, you know, so people relaxing, hanging out, probably doing drugs, whatever, <laughs> at school, you know, it's, 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 it's a kind of image that's been put across that if it's not sitting rigidly, then you're off doing this kind of relaxation therapy, which people don't like. What would you do with your school? For teachers, it means really high expectations of every kid. Because once you're differentiating, it has to be that kid has to have high expectations. Access to use and diagnosis of what's happening with that child. So it's not anymore just a ranking. It's saying, I need to know what's going on with you. It's why national standards, I believe, are a bad thing. You may not, but I do. Thank you, thank you. I'll come over here now because I see support. <laughs> No one clapped over there, so I know where I belong. And this is the right side as well. So, uh, so, so it's about, obviously, using it in a formative way all the time, using that diagnosis, opportunity to develop a wider range of teaching practices, including a lot of ICT, that you're more like a learning broker, managing the students' uh, portfolio of learning so that they are linked with their needs all the time, and new approaches to developing knowledge and and new roles and forms of professionalisation, and I do urge you to carry on pushing towards being professionals. You are not professionals at the moment because you don't control your profession enough. And that's essential, I think, to being part of this kind of change as you're moving further down that line. And for, and for the state, Nikki Kay, you can clap if you like. I think she's a great person, by the way, so hopefully she'll be a great... Minister of Education, their job is to make sure that they're talking to you about the resources being flexible, being personalised, that they're building schools, they're training, initial teacher education, they support you in professionalisation, they support you in ICT, they create a system because that's the key point we started with. You can't have a revolution in your own head. You can do a reasonable job of your school changing, hopefully all the teachers agree and your school community allows you to do it, but it's really hard. It's really hard. The way for us to change is to change the system. Not to another one-size-fits-all system, not to another one, but one which permits you, as a school, to figure out your way of doing this kind of new thing. What do your kids need? What is your teaching profession like? What's your community on about? Where are these kids going to go to? You will have quite different flavours in the way you personalise, otherwise it would not be personalised. It was just another form of standardising education. It would not have been the change. But there has to be this change. And I would urge you all the time, as a profession, to lead, place pressure on the system to shift and do things that allow you to move down this kind of line if that's where you want to go. And the last point I want to leave you with is it's about leadership. Leadership is not just about occupying a position of leadership. It's about leading. And leading means you've got ideas. So you need to understand what the situation is, where's the world going, have a good grip on that for yourself, be able to explain that to people, and then say, and that's why I want to change education to this. Because otherwise people will just say, well, I don't understand why you're doing this. This is, this is outside my experience. Why is this happening? Understanding, showing what the response is because of that understanding, is the key to bringing people with you and do it with others. Distribute the leadership. All teachers can be leaders. So you're running the school, you're, in many ways, this is the most important group in the school because on a day-to-day -day basis, you're the ones who have to do it. You have enormous opportunity to bring people with you, 
personalise the culture, personalise what goes on. It's a, a culture change in the school is absolutely vital. You've got leadership, you need to shift the culture, get people to understand this is what's going on, get the whole community. Don't shut yourself off and say, let's change the school, and then the parents are left wondering what's going on. Change has to be one that you're personalising the culture of the school and organise. Change the day-to-day -day way you run your school. If you go to Elfriston, for example, anybody from Elfriston? Lovely school when they were first built. It was great to go there and just hear them say, in a modest way, it wasn't a huge revolution, but in a modest way, we have reorganised the way the day works. Because, as Ken Robertson tells us once again, this whole notion that you go 45 minutes, bell rings, shift, 45 minutes, bell rings, shift. They said this kind of periodisation of the day, whatever period you use, they said we don't want to do that anymore because we don't want to interrupt the learning process. So <coughs> let's reorganise the day in a way which allows students and teachers to finish their learning all the time. Simple change in the organisation, but absolutely vital to do. But it's up to you. Understand what are the drivers, what are you going to do in response to those, and I think if that's the way you think, you will not want to run an education system the way that I was brought up, no matter what strengths it had, you'll want to change to something different. Have a wonderful conference and go home and lead. No questions? Uh, Steve, thank you very much. It is always um, a pleasure to um, hear Steve. I've had the pleasure of being able to do that on many occasions, and it's great to have our thinking um, challenged. Um, I like that line, um, I want it all, I want it now. I think Freddie Mercury sort of had something to do with that line <laughs> as, as well. Uh, and that's very much where, where our young are at. And um, so really that challenge, as, as Steve was pointing out there, is if that's their thinking, um, what are we doing to prepare them for their future and not just regurgitating more of the same of what we experience. So thank you so much for all those thoughts and all those challenges, Steve. And I'm sure that really just gets us um, open and prepared to what we can um, hear more of throughout this conference. So a pleasure to have you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Just, uh, just, before I, just before I leave, just while you're changing, oh, come on, come on up. Um, I read all the time, which is what you do. And I just, if you haven't read these books, these are quite inspiring books. This is called Cleverlands, which uh, if you just go to, go to Google, um, go to Amazon, type it in, you'll get it. It's by a school teacher, a British school teacher, a young school teacher, who travelled to five countries that they, she thought had wonderful education systems and says, this is what I learnt are the strong points of these systems. So, really interesting book. Ken Robertson, who people have been inspired by, finally got annoyed by people after his speeches saying, very inspiring, but what do I do? So he decided to write a book. So his book is out a couple of years ago now called Creative Schools. Ken's one. Really, that, this is probably closer to what, what I talk about than Cleverlands, but similar. And I, I think a really, really well-researched book is Teaching and Learning in the 21st Century, which is a, a study of Six Nations policies, and it's a bit drier but really, really, I think, very good in terms of just giving you a real rundown of what kind of simple changes could be made in systems to move them more towards where we are here. Go well.